All right, it's three o'clock. We're gonna get the show on the road. Looks like most people are here by my head count. Um, welcome to CST 8215, Summer Edition. Um, I'll go through the introduction first. Usually my first lecture is actually pretty short, all said and done, uh, because you know things are happening and you're not quite settled in yet and it's better not to try to jam too much stuff in your brains at, on the first day anyways. Okay, before I do this, I start and introduce myself so you guys have an idea of what you're dealing with. Um, I'm a college graduate, not a university guy, so I have a college diploma like you guys are trying to get. Uh, mind you, it's been a few years since that happened. Um, graduated from the college in North Bay in 96. Um, I've been working as a professional developer ever since, so if you want to talk about op uh, employment opportunities, I've been unemployed a grand total of two weeks in 24 years, just so you know. And those two weeks were voluntary, so I needed a break. Um, I work full-time and I teach part-time, so that has some implications in general for everybody, you guys and me included. That means I'm putting in a 37-hour work week through the week on top of spending 11 hours with you guys, well, 10 hours a week with you guys. Doesn't mean I'm gonna teach you guys less, it just, it means a few things. One, my knowledge tends to be pretty up to date and current, because, well, I'm using it all the time. Uh, two, um, my stuff tends to be pretty well documented, as in, you know, what the assignments are, and what my expectations are, so that there's less round tripping, because I hate it when it happens at work when I get too much round tripping, so I try to avoid as much round tripping at school also. Um, three, I actually tend to respond to emails fairly quickly, surprisingly. It's, you'd think it'd be the other way around. But I'm sitting in front of a computer with email all day, so, you know, enough said there. Um, I currently work for a company called Cadlink Technology. Uh, I'm a full stack web developer, so I do everything from data, from server install to database design to database setup to, you know, developing the application right up to the website, right, right to the web server browser. Um, so I've got a fair range of knowledge in the industry. Um, what kind of person am I? Uh, I'm, I have a fairly loose and easygoing teaching style. Um, I know, I know the stuff well enough that I usually don't use lecture notes, so don't ask for them. Just saying. My lecture notes are what you're going to see on the screen. I just use that as memory aid so I don't forget anything in any given lecture. Uh, I've been told I'm exceptionally sarcastic. Don't take it per personally. Um, following, I'm going to skip one bullet point for a second. Apparently, I'm also an equal opportunity offender. Uh, as in, I will pick on everyone equally. Makes no difference who you are, where you're from, what you've done. It's all good. It's just my sense of humor, and some people don't like it, and that's life. Um, we're all adults, so, you know. But if I do do something that upsets you a lot, you know, after class, take me out to the hall, and we'll have a chat. And we'll, I'll try not to repeat whatever the heck I might have said that day. Um, I don't mean I'm mean, that's not it. It's just, you know, I'll call people out on stuff they do in class. God help you if I catch you playing games in class because you will be ridiculed for the rest of the term. Just putting it out there. Um, going with that same idea, I know life happens. If you can't make it a class, that's okay. As you can see, I'm wearing a rig on my head which tells me I'm wearing a microphone and there's a camera pointing at me right there which tells you I record all my lectures. And they're usually posted within 24 hours. So if you're sick, don't come make me sick. I lose my voice when I get sick. Therefore, I can't lecture, which means you guys are gonna fall behind because I can't talk. Just saying. Um, also, it means you won't make your classmates sick. Therefore, isolate yourself if you get sick. You're not gonna miss anything really except for the ability to ask questions. So, as I said, life happens. If there's some unknown reason something happens and you can't get an assignment done on time, I won't take a 11.55 p.m. email saying, oh, can I have an extension? No. Odds are you knew before 11.55 that something was going wrong in your life. So please, at that point, give me enough heads up. Oh, 
Okay, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. In uh, as the weeks come along, you'll learn how to get here faster. <laughs> and I usually tend to start a little bit later, but I'm trying to, today, I'm trying to get it today done fairly reasonable pace. So no big panic. I'm not offended. Okay. Continue. This is the recommended textbook. Uh, you automatically get dinged for it, so you might as well download it. It's in your uh, course requirements on um, whatever the heck the online thing is. Yes? Yeah, well, it's including your tuition. Okay, just hold on. Don't panic everybody yet. There's more coming. Okay, my rules for success, that's the next one. Come to lecture if you're not sick or if you're not in a hospital or if you're not broken down. Insert reason here. Um, and a lot of teachers take attendance. I don't. Why? Because I record my lectures. Therefore, I know Brightspace tells me if you've actually jumped the link to the video. I can go look. So you can say, yeah, I watched the videos. And well, if you didn't jump the link, well, you know, it gets a little hard to prove at that point. Um, two, do your work. Should go without saying. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody in here is an adult. So I'm going to treat you like an adult and I assume you're going to do your job. Just like I do with my juniors at work. I give them something to do. I expect it done. I give you guys reasonable timelines. It's not like I say, hey, do this 16-hour assignment by tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. I don't do that. Ever. That's just me. Hand in your work on time. This applies to assignments. I give you guys a period of time to do an assignment. Usually it's two weeks. And then I give you guys a one week grace period with a 10% penalty. So if you happen to go over, so you make it past the min, and I'm reasonable. I mean, if you're two minutes after midnight, I'm not going to care. But, you know, if you're three days late, two days late, there's a 10% penalty. So you're losing, it's almost impossible to get an A plus on your assignment. If you're more than two weeks late, you get a zero. You make my life a lot easier. Because if I have work I don't need to grade, I'm not going to get graded. Um, but, I mean, essentially, I'm get, that would say you guys have got an entire month doing an assignment before you get a zero. So, really? It's pretty bad. Um, if you don't hear me assign it in class, then it's not due. This is actually an old bullet point from years ago when our LMS system was a little flaky. And it would randomly change the due dates on things and make assignments due and not due, random. We had issues. Um, that well, Most of those problems don't exist anymore, so it's good news. Um, labs are due by the start of the next lecture. So essentially, you will have until next week, for example, to get this lab set up. But I'm actually, for the first lab, I actually wait a little longer for obvious reasons. Because some people may not have their computers, some people may not, you know, having network password issues, insert reason here. Um, which, normally I don't have a slide for this, but I am going to put it out now. For those who ask, when do I need a computer? Now, you're in a computer programming course goes without saying. I'm saying that because I've had students in the past show up two weeks and go, by when do I need a computer two weeks into the course? Like, no, you need it. The sooner the better. If you don't have one now, have one so you can get your stuff set up by next week because that's when you actually have to do start doing real work. So you have a week to do labs. If they're late, it's an automatic zero with a caveat. I normally give what I call the last week's what I call the pity party. The pity party is when everybody that didn't do their labs shows up with their labs to show them to me and get half, half grades on it. In other words, you didn't do labs two and three and you go, oh man, my grade's sucking now. Maybe I should do that lab. You can come the last week and I'll give you at most 50%, but I'm giving you a chance to redeem yourself. But that's only in the last week of the course. But if you don't come in, it's still gonna be zero. All right, what can you expect this term? You can expect lectures, labs, assignments, tests, the usual things you get in school. 
Uh, the exam is actually in two pieces, just so you know. Uh, that will be explained much later. Uh, for those that are happily taking shots of the screen, all these slides are online on Brightspace. So you have copies of them. Um, my lectures are free form, as I mentioned earlier. I don't use lecture notes, as in some profs will have practically a book of what they're going to cover each lecture. I don't. Um, I use the slides and I record my lectures, which is actually better. Um, labs are gradual and they peak difficulty around week eight or nine. Uh, although this might not be quite true this time because I've rejigged my labs trying to make them a little more sane, reasonable. I've been teaching 8215 for six years. And, you know, every once in a while we realize that we need to adjust how we do things. And there's, you guys are my test pilot group on how I've adjusted my labs. Yay. Um, assignments are submitted via Brightspace. If ever in my labs you see the word Blackboard, just substitute for Brightspace. We used to be on Blackboard. I just may have missed the word Blackboard here and there in my slides. Uh, and I always give at least two weeks to do them. And my assignments are not brutal. They're not killers. So the first assignment tends to be the longest one to do. And considering you're supposed to do it as a group, and I've had students ask me how long it would take me to do it, and I can do it in 20 minutes from start to end. So I give you guys two weeks to do it. It's fair. Um, tests are online. I don't do them in class. It's a waste of time. Uh, do you have a week to do them? They normally take about an hour, so no excuses. That being said, I do expect you guys to not sit in a circle and do the tests as a group. Yeah, I'm sure 20% of this group is still going to do that. It's your loss, not mine. Um, but the college is cracking down on cheating this year. Uh, there has been his, you know, a bit of an issue in recent times. So, yeah, we're pretty um, solid on cheating. And I have gotten students expelled in the past. And if you're in a foreign exchange student, it really sucks because you have to go home at that point and explain why you're being sent home early because they revoke your student visa. So there are implications. So, uh, well, I mean, I'm not saying the Canadian students are off any better, but, you know. You still have to explain why you're not going to school anymore to someone, such as life. Just don't cheat. My tests aren't hard. My assignments aren't hard. It's not worth cheating. Um, again, the tests take about an hour, and I give you a week to do them. So there's not a lot of excuse of why you didn't do your tests. Mind you, in the past, I've had students end up in the hospital for a week. You know, odds are you can get a message to me within a week saying, I'm in the hospital, and I'll say, prove it. And often I'll take a, a selfie from a hospital bed is a great way to prove, unless it's really disgusting, I don't want to see it. But usually a selfie from the hospital bed is a lot more believable than a doctor's note you can print off the internet. Yes, I know those sites exist and they cost $24.99 US. I've been around the block, guys. I know all the dirty tricks. I also know about people that dump their exams. And guess what? None of my tests are you'll be able to find online this year because they're all new. So for those of you that are used to going online and paying little fee to get your brain dumps from other students, it's going to suck to be you because they don't, they don't exist. I started, I'm started doing fresh tests this year. Lecture recording. I'm trying to make a slide about this to explain this. It's a value-added service, and I cannot guarantee it. Why? Because it's not required. I just do it because it's, you know... Makes my life easier, makes your guys' life easier, but sometimes things happen. You know, my laptop could suddenly melt and I can't record a lecture. Or, you know, I've got to make sure that my batteries don't die in my transmitter pack, stuff like that. It happens. Uh, I usually upload to YouTube within a day or two. I actually, there is actually a YouTube channel with about five years worth of lectures on there. So not just my current lectures, my previous lectures, and lectures in different courses are there also. Because I also teach, um, during the year, during the January term, the winter term, I teach Linux. And I have covered a database course for a different course also. So, you know, there's lots of lecture material there if you need to review. All right. So what will you be learning this term? Basic database design. Okay. SQL. Views, triggers, and stored procedures. Mind you, the last on that slide, there's a lot less emphasis on it. Uh, than there used to be. And then I have a clause called other stuff. Uh, because I teach by anecdote, 
I also teach you guys some stupid things you shouldn't do um, because I've done pretty much every dumb thing you could do to a database. You do it for long enough, you're bound to make mistakes, and I've made some doozies over the years. So uh, you will be learning other things as in best practices and stuff like that. Um, as I was highlighting that triggers and store procedures, the focus is going away on that a little bit. Um, I'm in the middle of transitioning because some of you may have heard that next September, the terms are shorter by a week. And you're also getting a reading week starting September. So, you know, when you guys start your course in September, get yay, your terms are a week shorter. So we have to start deciding what, where we're going to cut. So I'm going to treat you guys where you're somewhere between the normal length term and the shorter term. So you'll get more like what the guys in September would be getting. So you're not falling behind and you're not being treated any differently than the fall cohort, which is actually pretty good for you guys because that means you're going to be hitting the books at the same pace as everybody else. All right. Here's how your grades are broken down. Labs are 10% of your grade. So essentially there's 10 labs. Do the math. Each lab's worth 1% of your grade. And yes, you can absolutely pass the course without doing any labs, assuming you do well on the assignments. Um, quizzes are 10%. Uh, in this case, what I mean by quizzes is the hybrid work, that extra little bit of work you guys need to do. There's eight of those. Yes, eight. There's two assignments, 10% each. So your two assignments combined is 20%. There are two tests. Again, 10% each. So you can see that nothing's, not one single piece is going to be worth a huge crippling amount. Except for the final exam. The final exam in this course is 40% of your grade. The good news is I do it in two pieces. There's a practical component and a theory component. So they're each worth 20%. So in the end, you'll be writing your exam in two parts, one the week before the exam and one during exam week. Um, and that's, I'll be explaining the details on that much later, but you know, that's so you know. All right, this is also known as a, what they call a 323 course. Uh, that, depending on what your previous schooling is, you may not have heard th this kind of numbering. It means you're, you're expected to have three hours of theory. In other words, two hours in class and one online. That's the hybrids. Um, two hours of lab and three hours of study time. As in, we're expecting you to spend three hours doing re reviewing and stuff like that. Which will lead you to... Um, some of the other stuff where I don't really assign homework. So that three hours of study time is really time to do your labs or to do the assigned reading, prepping for whatever else. So it's fairly reasonable. All right, here's the official to pass the course you must. This actually slide came from another prof who said you really should have this because students never seem to understand this statement. You must write the final exam. No, really, you have to come in and at least put your name down and answer one question. So even if you're sitting at like a 98 and you decide, I don't want to write the final exam, too bad, you're coming. You can circle one answer and be done. Why would you do that? I don't know. But, you know, in theory. Um, you must get 50% on tests and exam combined. I'm talking about the theory portion. So if you take the two tests and the theory exam, combined percentage between them must be 50%. So if you bomb one test, do really good on another test, and then you do okay on the exam, you're going to pass. If you bomb two tests well, you better do darn good on your exam. Uh, because the, the two tests, the two theory tests you're going to have through the term is 20%, and the theory portion is 20%, so yeah, no. Um, you should, you know, you need basically 50% on everything to pass. Um, same thing with the practical work, which is the labs, then the practical exam. You need to get 50% of combined grade on that. You must submit both assignments and most labs. Now, I, I'll put a little bit of a clarification on submit both assignments. If life happens and you're unable to do the work and you can give me a sufficiently believable excuse, and it's got to be a good one, um, then okay you may get exempted from one. Um, 
Now, if you call me and say you had your dog died six times through the term, um, either you have an awful lot of dogs or uh, you keep buying dogs and killing them, which is bad, or you're pulling my leg. Two of these threes, two of these three I'll buy. One I won't buy. Although, you know, if you're killing dogs, I might be judging you in a different kind of way. So just saying, you know, I do the work. It's not a lot. Okay, supported hardware and software. I support Windows laptops. Just saying right now. If you're not running Windows, it's going to suck. Either install Windows on your Mac, and I see at least one glowing apple in this room. Oh, I see two glowing apples in this room. Or you install a VM with Windows on it. If you don't know how to do that, uh, ITS can help you. Uh, why will I not help you? Yes, I know how to install Windows. Uh, no, I don't know how to do it under Mac. Why? Because I don't use Mac, ever. Um, and some of the software stack that we're using does not work on Mac at all. So, you know, you're not going to have a good time. You could theoretically go find your own version of all the software and try to do it that way. Knock yourself out. It's going to be rough. Um, Linux users. It's totally doable except for one thing. And there are alternatives that work on Linux. So if you really want to run Linux, knock yourself out. Odds are if you're already running Linux, you probably know what you're doing anyways, and you probably won't need my help. But I can theoretically help you most of the way. Okay. Now, if I can get my mouse to come back from the dead, that'd be great. Uh, before I start out with the rest of the lecture, I'm going to go take a visit to Brightspace and show you guys where things are and where things are going to start showing up as we go. Okay, mind you, this is the teacher's view, so it's a little different from you guys because I've got stuff hidden away from you guys that you can't see, but you'll be able to see it here. Um, inside Brightspace, and have you guys seen, had an introduction to Brightspace yet? Maybe, day one, theoretically, maybe not. It's actually fairly reasonable to use. Things are, are a little strange in Brightspace land. Um, but as far as I can see, every LMS is weird, so you know, no matter what we use, it's going to be rough. You will find under the course home is where the basic announcements will show up. There are the good old message we're now required to post about plagiarism and cheating. It's on the first page. Um, under content is where most of what you're going to want to see is going to be. Uh, I don't have due dates all set up yet because I've had a really busy two weeks at work. So I haven't had a chance to play with the calendar to put in all the due dates. Those will show up by the end of the week, just so you know. Uh, under the course, the table of contents for the course, there are course documents, which has a course outline. My class policies are listed there. Um, you will also find in here eventually my contact information and my class times for my labs. And that's because I allow people to come to whatever lab they want. Not for the first two, three weeks because, you know, people are really, really going to be packed as it is. But after the first couple of weeks, couple, three weeks, lab attendance tends to drop off fairly quickly because, you know, I don't take attendance. So why would you bother coming to your class unless you need help? Uh, then you can start migrating between lab sections. So if you, you have a job and they keep scheduling you on, I don't know, Wednesday at 3 o'clock and your lab's Wednesday at 3 o'clock, well, maybe you'll be able to come at, you know, 5 o'clock or 7.30 or whatever the heck it is, or uh, 5.30. Um, on here, we have the two official documents about the dishonesty. i got to keep pointing that out. It's unfortunate, but I do. Um, you'll also see a section called Weeks. I still need to post a CSI, but essentially that is the CSI. I'm just going to be copy-pasting this into a CSI. So this is a week-by-week -week breakdown of what we're doing. Uh, lecture slides are going to be there. There's a point, a uh, link to each lab is in there. If there's an assignment, it's going to be in here. And just so that I can, for the people that say, well, it's a
Uh, but those are the chapters. So every, every time you see like chapter one, pages one to 17, you should probably read that this week. So it pretty much goes in step with what I'm covering or what might be in a test or whatever. Um, broken down week by week. As you'll see when we get close towards the end of the weeks, uh, you'll see some gapping in here towards the end. No, don't, no, don't do that. Um, you'll see like week 14 is kind of empty and then week 11 is kind of empty. Um, I leave room in case things change or like run out of time one week in a lecture or I one lecture went really fast for whatever reason it happens. That you know, sometimes a lecture will take an hour and a half for one group and it'll take an hour for another group. So maybe I'll grab the next week's lecture and just keep going. It gives us some free space, some breathing space towards the end, uh, which is good. Um, after the breakdown by weeks, I also have all the labs in one place. So if you really want all the labs, they're also all in one place. So not you don't need to go week by week if you want to try to reach ahead. The labs are all live, so you can see them all right to the end. Um, it happens every once in a while, usually once per group where I've got a student that actually has database experience and or they're coming from another school where they've already taken database courses and they'll just blow through all the labs, just get it over with. I'm not going to force you to do the labs on a week by week basis. I, you just, if you think you can do it, knock yourself out. I don't mind. Uh, hybrids. Hybrids do not have a due date. They're due essentially the last week before the term ends. It's fair enough. I'm not going to handhold you guys on your hybrids on a week by week basis, but I would strongly recommend you try to do them at a decent pace because some of the stuff will help reinforce what you're learning. Uh, assignments, you guys can't see them yet, but there's two assignments in here. Um, there's two tests, which you can't see. They're there. Now there's a nice empty area here called recordings. Guess what's going to go in there? class recordings. And then at the end, you can see one last one, which I'm not going to click on, practical exam. I don't need to start feeding you guys or make people panic early because people panic when they see this right off the bat and they panic after they've been here for 10 weeks. So, you know, at week zero or week one, it's not nice to do that to you guys. That's roughly where everything is. Like I said, I'll have my class times and locations posted on here. Uh, I will have a CSI up shortly. Like I said, it's been a kind of a crazy couple of weeks at my day job, you know. They decided to book everything while I wasn't teaching. Go figure. Um, and I'll cover a few other questions that often get asked of me as the term goes along. Yes, I play video games. Yes, I know what Discord is. Yes, I watch anime. There we go. No, I'm not a weeb. But my mal list is sitting over 500 shows. So just so you know. So that's what you need to know about me. And yes, I do know what the, usually the course Discord is for every course. So don't use that while you do a test. Because A, I know what it sounds like. B, I know what it looks like. And C, I actually tend to watch it on my phone during a test. So, and if you say, oh, I created a channel just for this, you'd be really surprised how cooperative Discord is with schools. Just saying. Uh, yes, if you use Discord during a test, there's a good chance I'll catch you. And it's going to suck for you and everybody else in that group. Because you know when you sign up for Discord, you usually sign up with your email address, right? It's not hard to trace email address to student at that point. So yeah, just don't do it. All right. As I said at the head at the start of this, today's lecture is pretty short because everybody's still running around with their like chickens with their heads cut off. Um, so this is the first set of slides. This is lecture one. It's actually a really short one. It's only six slides, but there's actually an awful lot of talking that go with the six slides. Um, because I'm not one of those teachers that uses, you know those slide decks that come with the textbooks that have like an entire novel on each slide and it's like 72 slides long? My slides are actually what PowerPoint slides should be, which is, you know, a summary of what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, since we're taking a course about database, the first thing we should understand is what is data? And over the years, this hasn't changed. I've been doing database, working with databases since I went to school. 
And, you know, I took my first database course in 94. And until recently, we were actually using the same textbook I was when I was in school, just a newer edition. Uh, this new textbook is actually a lot easier to read than that one, which is good. But the concepts are fairly similar and nothing's really changed. Uh, no matter what anybody tells you, really database hasn't changed in 40 years. The concepts are all the same. So what is data? Data is unprocessed facts. That sounds like a weird phrase, and it is. Essentially, and you're going to see I'm going to avoid the word information as far as much as I can on this slide. Facts are description of things out there. Believe it or not, each of you is a fact. The school's a fact, the weather outside's a fact, your pet cat's a fact, your stupid pet dog is a fact. I'm a cat person, <laughs> just so you know. Um, no, I don't hate dogs, I just think they're dumb. Um, those are facts. It's basically unprocessed, as in it hasn't been refined, it hasn't been organized, it's just random assortment of, you know, stuff. And it's basically the ephemeral meta information of about the world around you. It's everything around us. And literally everything is data. Now, usually I used to ask this, how, how many people have seen The Matrix? Usually, yeah, I see, the, the older I get, the less people have seen it. And, you know, it's starting to make me feel old. Yeah, it was 1999 when it came out. So, you know, it's really, I'm starting to feel old. But The Matrix actually does represent one thing where reality is all information. Not the next two movies, those sucked. But the first one, where reality is actually information. And literally everything around you is, in, is data. You know, the color of the panels on the wall is data. The color of the floor is data. You know, what kind of laptop and the specs of your machine is data. What co what's your shoe size is data. How bad your feet smell is data. It's all data. And in other words, it's all the things. So for those of you that like following the happy memes on Reddit, you know, it's all the things. All the things around you is data. And I've already used weather as an example. Now, what is organized data? Organized data is data that's been organized. That goes without saying. But to be more precise, it is structured. As in, we've taken the data, we've broken it down to its component pieces, we've built a little box to put it in, and then, you know, it fits a mold. For example, every single one of you filled out a student application to come here. You all filled out the same information. Mind you, there's some variations, you know, if you're not a Canadian citizen or a foreign exchange student, you have a little bit more information to fill in. A Canadian student may have different information to fill in. But however, the most of it's all the same. You fill in your name, your date of birth, your sex, you know, any identifying information you need to know about you, your how are you going to pay us? Because they really care about that. You know, but it's all structured data. It's not information yet. It's just data. In other words, it's been broken down, put into its component pieces, and you all roughly understand what's happening to, the in, to that data. In other words, it looks like a form. So it's a bit like if you fill out a survey, everybody fills out the exact same survey, everybody fills in the same form information, you apply for a credit card, you go to the bank, they all ask the same questions, they put in all the same stuff, unless it's TD, they suck. Don't ask, their data systems are terrible. You know, but basically all the same information is contained, the same data is contained by for each um, system. Now, at this point it's structured. Organized means it can be retrieved in a reasonable manner. As in other words, it's not hard to work with this information because it's organized. And one of the things that you'll develop in this course is learning how to organize your thoughts. It's actually a perk. It's not the target of this course, but you tend to learn about breaking down information. And when I talk to my daughter, my 18-year-old daughter, she it drives her nuts because I ask stupid questions, she thinks. But I've learned to ask certain questions as I go through life because yeah, it's information that's useful. You know, it's data that's good to have. And I tend to organize my stuff. Now, this is always a fun question I ask at this point. How many of you have an, a trash heap of a room? Don't be shy. I mean, uh, usually a quarter of the groups are, are pigs. And then you got the other side, which how many of you are neat freaks? And I don't mean OCD level, but you know, 
you know, you're, you're not going to have two week old McDonald containers on your on your bedside table. You walk into your living room and you don't have like six inches of clothing, which should actually be in the wash down, you know, wherever. You know, I'm just, you know, you're fairly neat and tidy. Now, the difference is the ones that tend to be neat and tidy will have a slightly under, better understanding on the organization side of this course. Those of you that are tr messy will tend to develop the ability to, to think in broken down pieces. So that's one of the perks of the database course is you learn to break things down to its smaller component pieces and you can see the big picture while still seeing the details. So you, a lot of people have heard the phrase, losing the trees for looking at the forest, right? You look at all the forest, you don't actually see the trees. Well, this course teaches you to focus on the trees and still realize there's a forest behind it. That's the organized side of this, as in you're learning to focus on the details without losing the sight of the big picture. Um, stored. At that point, when the data is organized, it's usually being stored somewhere. Back in the day, they were in filing cabinets. How many people here have worked with an accountant, like a real accountant? They like their paper, don't they? My accountant at work is insane. Like he's got stacks of paper all the time. And it's all organized. I think it's chaos, but it's all organized. And you know, he's got filing cabinets that are stored and organized in certain ways for all everything he needs to deal with. And you know, that's storage. Nowadays, most of our stuff goes into a database, into something inside of a computer, and it works. Uh, and a good example is historical weather databases which I recently discovered, there's actually one for Ottawa that shows all the records for how much snow we've had and how long the winters have been. And congratulations, those of you that aren't from here might have heard, not heard this. We just had our longest winter on record by four days. The longest time we've had snow on the ground at the airport since we started recording it in the 1940s. It sucked. For those of you that aren't from around here and are used to coming from somewhere a lot warmer, <laughs> oh, you're going to have fun. Uh, don't skimp on your winter clothing. Now brings us to information, which I've tried to avoid using, but I tend to throw it out there. The phrase information. Information is when you take the organized data and you transform it into something useful for humans. Uh, anybody here ever work in sales? Okay, a few more hands in this case. And uh, any of you guys ever work for commission sales? Yeah. Okay, commission sales. You know all about this one, right? That report at the end of the month that, that shows the percentage of sales you had or whatever way your metrics your company uses. And they give you this nice little report and you're hoping it's above a certain line. Because if it's below that line, you go for coaching. If it's below that line a second time, you're probably not employed anymore. So there's a magic line they want you to match all the time. That is information, as in they took all the, inf all the data that happened through the month, all your sales, and accumulated them, and then turned it into a report. And then your manager sits there and looks at it and goes, huh, 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 huh. <laughs> then, you know, either you're going to have a really good day or a really bad day after that bunch of grunting that your manager does. And other information, data that gets turned into information is weather reports, uh, one that you guys really should care about, your grades. I take all the raw data of all your assignments, I put them into Brightspace, and it gets organized into a report that gives you a letter at the end. And that is information. Your entire 14 weeks with Dan gets summarized down to a single letter. No pressure, I'm just saying this is literally what happens. It's a summary of everything you've done. So usually information is data that's been summarized and turned into reports, all kinds of reports. Um, whether the student satisfaction reports, there's an example of you know, data that's useless that gets converted into something that's more useful and then we ignore. I'm kidding, I shouldn't say that. Actually, I do care about those student evaluations at the end of the term because it tells me how bad or good I did that term, so you know. So, summarized in data is information. Information processing is the process converting the raw data into something meaningful for someone. So, all that data that's collected from your existence gets summarized somewhere, 
And bits and pieces of it are useful for more than different people, right? For example, your employment history, Revenue Canada loves to know your income. And they love to know how much money they should take away from you every year. The school cares about your performance because, you know, it's a reflection on how well the teachers are doing or how well the school is doing, if we can keep you guys engaged. Other information would be weather trends. Over the last number of years, you know, the earth is warming up, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to get political. But the earth is warming up and funny things are happening. Those of us in Canada have nicer weather. Other parts of the world are drying up. But those are weather trends. In other words, we take all that statistical information, we summarize it, and it becomes something useful for someone that cares. That is information. All right, so when we're dealing with information, information is modified by something called business rules. And business rules is a really old term. As in, this is a concept that's been around for a long, long time, and it's starting to get out of style, let's say. Whereas in, they're not called business rules so much anymore, but you know, sometimes some people still care enough to call them that. Uh, nowadays, they're more known as system requirements. So if you're wondering what business rules is becoming, it's becoming system requirements where we're abstracting the human element of the business rule more because we all want to be ruled by machines. So we don't have to make any decisions for ourselves. Um, business rules are also known as constraints. In other words, what are the rules of engagement with any given piece of data? It's integral to the design of the database because if you don't know the rules of engagement, as in what is this data, where did it come from, what is it supposed to do, you can't design properly. The stupid thing is, this is usually based on policies, rules, and general practice inside wherever you're working. So for example, the business rules for a Canadian government agency will be very different than the business rules for a small private company. A small private company like I work for, we have a grand total of 60 employees worldwide. Our rules are very different and how we treat data is very different than say, the federal government of Canada, which loves its rules and its processes and its policies. And the database design will be modified based on those rules of engagement. Our rules are loose-ish where I work, as in there's not a lot of steps between taking down somebody's credit card information and then taking their money. Or, hey, Dan, can you go fix that typo on the website because Vincent doesn't know how to spell for the third time this week. You know, simple things like that. Whereas with the government, you know, there's procedures. And if you want to fix that typo, it's a three-week process. As in, you're, you have to make the change, then your manager approves it, then their manager approves it, then their manager approves it, then the local whatever head approves it, then it, all the approvals roll back down. It takes three weeks to fix a typo on a website. That's just because how it's designed. But that will modify how you design the database. Why? Because you have to actually add checks and balances for everything, for all those steps. Whereas with a flat organization, you don't have those. Those are policies, rules, and general practice. Um, other rules would be, you know, do we find this data important? We may not find certain things important. Let's say this, you know, the college may find certain data important, as opposed to what, you know, the average little company down the street, the hot dog stand down the street, he doesn't care what your name is. He just cares what kind of hot dog you're eating that week. So his data is completely different. So that will modify what they tend to collect. So here's a table, yay, um, which is good that I post all this stuff on Brightspace so you don't need to write it all down as I go through them. However, there are some basic characteristics every business rule has. And this is so that when you design your database, when you get to the database design part of this course, you'll grasp how you should take some of this on. Business rule number one, it should be declarative, or however you pronounce that word. A business rule is a statement of policy and describes what a process validates, but it doesn't describe how it's enforced. In other words, I can say, 
Attendance is optional. It's very clear. It's a rule, as in, I am not going to mark down attendance. However I choose to apply it is up to me, but that is the policy I use. It's very clear. It's declare, declarative, as in it's very clear and obvious. It must be precise. A rule must have only one interpretation amongst all interested people, and its meaning must be clear. That's something else you need to learn in land of computers. People with messy rooms. Precision. Which is going back to, remember I was joking about how I often ask my daughter stupid questions or she thinks they're stupid questions? No, it's because I'm trying to actually find out the precisely what the heck's going on. Trying to pin down an 18-year-old is challenging. A rule must have only one interpretation. As in, if I say, attendance is optional. Now, that's very precise, isn't it? As in, attendance is optional except on weeks four, five, and eight. Or if your name starts with B. That's still very precise. It's really stupid, but it's still very precise. If I turn around and say, attendance is kind of optional. That's not precise at all. Because depending on how, everybody in this room is going to hear, yeah, Dan says attendance is an optional. And I say, well, it's kind of optional, but I didn't give you the reasons why it's kind of, sort of, but not. <coughs> so it must be precise, as in, usually you tend to use very short sentences when you're describing a business process or the rule, because it must be precise. It cannot be interpreted more than one way. So when you start deciding, hey, what information must I collect? I must have the person's first name, middle initial, and last name. That's very precise, as opposed to saying, I need to have the person's name. Now, depending where you are in the world, from in the world, um, that gets very challenging. Anybody who's got a Hispanic name will know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't know if I have anybody in this group this term with a Hispanic name, but I do. You know what I mean about Hispanic names, right? How many middle names do you have? And then you got your first name, right? And then you got your last name, right? Okay. Now, if I turn around and go to look at a Canadian person, you probably have a first name, a middle name, and a last name. If I look at somebody from, say, East India, most of you have, what, two names? Family name, given name? Maybe three, depending on your religious background. And other parts of the world, you have two names. I've even had students where they only had one name. Because whatever country they came from, they only ever have one name. So their first name was their last name. It was really interesting learning about that. But me saying, you know, what is your name as opposed to I need your first name, your middle initial, and your last name, those are very precise rules. You need to learn about precision and finding out what you need. Atomic. A rule is indivisible, yet sufficient. Okay. In other words, a rule is self-contained. It cannot be broken down any further. That means you may have more rules, but they cannot be broken down. In other words, if I say, I must have your first name, last name, and your date of birth. Realistically, that rule can be broken down into two pieces, because I'm talking about a person's name and their date of birth, something everybody should have a name and a date of birth. So, you know, depending on how you want to apply that, you know, that may or may not be negotiable. However, if I had a rule that said, I must have your name and the name of your pets if you have any. See, that is not atomic. As in, they can be broken down into two separate pieces and they should be broken down to smaller pieces. Because one of that is optional, one of that is required. Therefore, if something is required, a rule cannot be required and optional at the same time because that's it's like saying, you know, we don't need the sun, but, you know, we need the sun. Think about that, right? It's optional, but it's not. And, uh, yeah. So, it must be indivisible. It must be its, its smallest component pieces. It should not be breakable into more than one piece. You may have more than one piece of data in the rule, 
but it should be self-consistent. If you're talking about names, that's good. You ask for date of birth, that's fine. You probably shouldn't do name, date of birth, and address all as one rule because how many of you are in residence? Okay, not many, if any. Um, that's the first for me to ask that question and get zero response. Um, it's not to be embarrassed that you're in res, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, okay, let's try this one. How many of you take the bus to get to school? Okay, almost everybody. How many of you are hoofing it, walking? If, if you want to go with the phrase, okay, that, I'm included. All right, I live close enough that I can walk. And the rest of you are probably driving and or being dropped off, right? That's things we can break down depending on how I ask that question. It could be, what is your mode of transportation, which is a very atomic, precise question, or are you walking? Are you driving? Those are separate rules. Um, consistent. A rule must be consistent both internally and externally. That sounds kind of stupid when you read it like that, but that means that a rule must be self-contained and it should make complete sense unto itself and it should also make sense to anybody looking at it from the outside. In other words, I should not write a rule in Swahili if nobody in here can read Swahili. And of course, Murphy's Law would say somebody's going to put up their hand and say, yes, I can. But I should not use, it's therefore because of a different language, the meaning of the words change. So depending on, you know, if you were, certain phrases in English are really dumb. And there's a reason why French is considered the international language for law because it's such a precise language. However, certain phrases in English do not translate at all to whatever your mother tongue may be if you don't happen to speak English as your first language. However, that means that the language for any given rule must be the same internally, externally. It means if it's written English, it must be understood in English by everyone. It's not open to interpretation. It must be self-contained onto itself. Expressible. It has to be Stated in natural language, in other words, I can say it in whatever language you speak. And it's translated properly, because you've got to be careful with those translations. And it is completely understandable by you. For example, you will not cheat. I love using that one as an example. I don't care what language you speak. Once I get it into your own language, it's the same thing. Right? Don't cheat. That means it's expressible. Me saying, oh, the, the moon is beautiful tonight. Depending on what language we're talking about, that means something completely different. If I was talking about Japanese, I'd be, in Japanese, I'd be making a pass at you. Just so you know. In English, it means the damn moon is beautiful. Right? That means it's not, there's interpretation. Based on what it is. But if it's written in a certain way that is translatable easily and everybody understands what the rule means, that means it's expressible. It must be clear. Distinct. Business rules are not redundant. But it may refer to other rules. Back to the whole atomic thing. Each rule must be self-contained. However, sometimes a rule may refer to another rule. For example, I could have a rule that says, I must have your first name and your last name. Except in cases where rule B applies. That means that rule is self-contained, right? Rule A is I must have your first name and your last name, except where B happens. And B could state, provide middle initial when applicable. So that means that rule one is self-contained. It's saying these are required, and by the way, Include B if it applies to you, but not required. So that's the distinctness of the rules, as in each rule must be self-contained, and they may refer to other rules. However, a rule must be self, its own piece. Okay. Now, believe it or not, like I said, the first piece is short. There's actually a lot of information on six slides, a lot of concepts. And I like letting that percolate for a little bit because, believe it or not, it gets actually a little overwhelming if I were to start throwing the actual 
the hard and fast concepts that are coming down the pipe. Um, now, what should you be doing this week, just so you know? Um, lab one, which is going to be starting, you know, tomorrow. It's setting up your software. If you have a computer, those of you that don't have a computer, well, yeah, no. Now, some students ask me, why do you waste a lab period on setting up software? For 90% of you, it's going to go peachy keen. For 10% of you, not so much. And then I spend, you know, the entire lab period helping three students because their computers just don't want to cooperate. Um, usually one of three things is causing it. One, you have a really old computer that does not meet the minimum requirements for this course. You'd be surprised how many of those I've tripped over in the last couple of years. Yes, I know the damn things are expensive. However, a $600 computer is enough to do this course. You don't need $3,200 laptop for this course. Just saying. However, you still will need it. So you need to set up your software. Uh, if you're on a Mac, like I said, get ITS to help you install Windows in a VM or help you boot camp your machine. Uh, I've been told that's what they're here for. Yay. Um, the other thing, you should start reading the first set of pages. It's only 17 pages. Um, it's covering a slightly different version of what I was just talking about. I'll talk about the history of the database server and what is a database and, you know, that kind of stuff. The, as you notice, I haven't actually spoken to what is a database yet. I've described everything around it, but I've danced all the way around it. I'm going to bite into that hard next week. But I'd rather you guys actually have a solid grasp on what is data versus information and what what tools or rules of engagement would be before you start thinking about what happens inside the darn computer. Um, that's basically it for this week. Um, the lectures will be longer than this in the future. But now you get to go have something to eat because you've got an hour to kill before your next class. I'm assuming you've got another class after this. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. All right. I'm going to hit the stop button on this recording. I hopefully recorded. <laughs>